Welcome to Season 3 of Soccer Over Gotham, an NWSL podcast covering New Jersey, New York, Gotham FC. Hosted by Ruby Pinto and Gary Gibson. Welcome to Episode 69 of Soccer Over Gotham. We have a great show for all of you. Gary, tell us what we have in this episode. We got a whole lot. Gotham begins their three-game and seven-day road trip. We are covering the first of two in this episode. First, Gotham travels to KC and falls to nothing. Then, Gotham heads to the east, to the Carolinas, and gets a late goal and escapes with a point. We preview next weekend's matchup on the road against the Chicago Red Stars. In our interview segment, I wanted to make the USLW League preview a regular thing. Last season, we interviewed Stephanie Savino, coach of Morris Elite. That was fantastic. This season, we are talking with the newest addition to the Metropolitan Division, GM of Paisley Athletic, Jennifer Tuesta. The future of women's soccer is here, and let's just get on board. But Ruby, there's so much to talk about. Let's just get started. How are you? I am doing great. Just got back from the dentist. We had to push the recording a little bit because I'll just save it for the end for our random thoughts because it kind of ha- I kind of have a part two of what happened six months ago, <laughs> what happened at All the right. dentist. Anyways, I was just there for a regular cleaning. Now I'm feeling like I have a million dollar smile. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, we, we're we're back with another episode and we just going to talk all things Gotham. Absolutely. And I just want to wish all of our Star Wars fans that are listening to this podcast a happy May the 4th. Yes. You know, I tried to make a Star Wars graphic, but <laughs> I needed more time. I just I realized like, oh, my God, today's May the 4th. I should make a graphic. But I think I should have started like yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Next time, guys. <laughs> all right. On to the podcast. This podcast update, Yasmin Ryan is now the top downloaded player interview. She passed Hensley Handcuff. Wow. Okay. <laughs> yeah. All right. Can't wait to do more. We hopefully got another one coming very soon. I'm excited. But team news, Allie Krieger is a finalist for Penn State Board of Trustees seat. That's a pretty cool honor. Fun fact, Allie led the Nittany Lions to four consecutive Big Ten titles. Wow, that's amazing. We're excited for her. And then regarding uh, being a finalist, she said, I'm excited to create impactful change at Penn State's highest level. It would be an honor to sit at the board of trustees and shape important decisions that will matter for years to come. That's awesome. I haven't seen an update. I think today is the day they're voting. So check our Twitter page, check our Instagram page for the results. Mm-hmm. On to this game, Ruby. We have a game to break down. We have two, actually. Let's get to the first one. This is the battle to see who won the offseason. Gotham has never beaten KC in four attempts. KC has an injury list nine deep. Our injuries, Torres out for the season, Dorsey still out for a personal uh, reason, and Midge is out with a hip injury. On paper, this is a 4-3-3. It's a 4-5-1 in practice. The difference is the wingers play usually high now they're playing low in, into the midfield gives you more of a balanced midfield and it's seen as more of a defensive formation it's more of a counter-attacking formation than the 4-3-3 which is more of an attacking formation the lineup ruby we have taylor smith lynn williams and yasmin ryan across the front Cerboni, long and muis in the midfield edmonds gene brunina and krieger and the back line and abby smith in goal any thoughts on this lineup we have a very strong lineup here strong uh, offense with lots of speed with Taylor Smith, Lynn Williams, and Jasmine Ryan. I, I really like that. And I also really like that Taylor Smith started in this game. She's been doing really, really good in the last couple games. So yeah, love it. I did not have Ellie Jean pushing Edmonds to the left, but <laughs> Ellie has been a natural. The The bench, again, is ridiculous. Anamanu, Fairley, Nicewanger, Freeman. O'Hara, even without Midge, it's ridiculous. Yeah, we definitely miss Midge, and hopefully she gets better soon, and hopefully we'll see her back on the pitch. But we have a ridiculously just amazing group of talent in here. Yeah, so let's just get to our overall thoughts and takeaways. I think, obviously, Ruby, we need to talk about Abby's performance. Yes. Fans tell me that I need to watch what I say because it comes true. Speaking of which... I said a couple episodes ago that some keepers are like that. They will give you brilliant performances, but have that one moment of 
what just happened? I'm not saying that's the case with Abby, but this was definitely one of those performances. <laughs> well, yeah, most things you say do come true. So just be careful <laughs> what you say. Here. But for real, Abby did have, well, I, I don't know if a what happened moment, but, you know, a little mistake out there. I think she kind of like had a miscalculation on her part and she thought she was going to get to that ball first, but it didn't. We just have to be careful because the Vina's back. Yeah, I think that she just made three incredible saves. Her confidence Oof. was just running so high that she just thought she could do anything. <laughs> Sometimes I'm so glad I'm watching these games at home because I jump off the couch and I'm like going crazy. That save and another save and another save. She was absolutely brilliant outside of that second goal. She could have had three saves up for save of the week. Ruby, what are your thoughts on Davinia? We cannot deny Davinia is one of the best players. And this is why KC wanted her. You blink and she will appear out of nowhere and score on you. So you have to be careful with her. Even though she's only 5'2", she's such a strong and fast player. Her shots are always dangerous. She's like on another level. It's incredible. I like watching her play just not scoring on us. <laughs> For real. And if we ever get the chance to get the, the Vina, I would love to have her at Gotham. Just saying. Yeah, she's one of the best players in the world. She punished us again. Last season, it was Bike. Um, and this season, it was Berninia. It's not really a slight at either of those two. Dubinia can do that to anyone. The only thing that you can do is try to stop her service, which Gotham does pretty well in the first half by simply having Zerboni just run Labonta over a couple times. Sometimes it's that's what you got to do. And if you look at the post-game pass map, huge circle, big, thick lines between Labonta and Dubinia. The only other suggestion I can come up with would be, other than just beating up on Labonta all, all game, <laughs> is to see Taylor Smith possibly at right back against Dubinia. Maybe her speed can be the difference. Ultimately, a shoulder shrug, Dubinia is inevitable. <sighs> yeah, but Taylor Smith, yeah. Taylor Smith is another gem. Like you said, Smith has speed. And yeah, I would love to see Smith challenge Davinia. It will be interesting to see. Maybe next game. We'll see. Player notes. I am fully on board with Jean at center back. So my first choice, of course, is Edmonds. There's no worries with Kristen. She's one of the best. But I think Jean has shown some great upside. I definitely put her above Freeman at this point. And, and that's the thing. We have so many good players that have shown to be good in new positions. Yeah, speaking of new players, we have to discuss Ryan and how good she's been. So again, this is a team with a ridiculous roster and veterans galore. She's pretty much been an every game starter and a solid contributor. She's improving game after game. Yeah, she definitely is. And if you guys have listened to the interview with Ryan, you know, I promise her the, I, I know what it's called now, the jelly bean game. It's the being boozled. So... <laughs> I have that ready for her for the next home game. So when I see her, I'm going to hand her the bean boozled and hopefully she she has fun. But anyway, <laughs> you, anyway, yeah, it's going to be fun. Anyway, we knew how good Ryan is, but, you know, we knew that. But we we just had so many like solid performances from her. I feel she she started this season really, really strong. So. She set the bar high now. This leads to a lot more confidence for Gotham. This is a more confident Gotham side than we've seen since we've been covering the Steam Ruby. Mm -hmm. It's a different mentality. So despite that 10 minutes of terror, you never felt like this team was out of it. You feel like there's always a chance. That hasn't been the case since we covered this team, especially last season. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Gotham from last season, it's, it's a different story for sure. We didn't see the drive we are seeing this season. It's very exciting for me and for many to see the turnaround of this team. We know what they're capable of, but there are like men, there were mental blocks last season, or maybe not having the right coach that fits them. Maybe that was an issue as well. Now we do, and we still have six more months, more or less like six months into the, se the season. So just get ready. Yeah, get ready. So far, Gotham has been the highest pressing team in the league. Good on KC on playing through Gotham's press. Gotham does well early to be physical with KC's pivots. Zerboni, again, plows Zabonta over at least two times in the early going. 
KC adapted in the second half and found the space to play behind Gotham's high line over and over. You're not going to have fun when LeBron has time to pick out the Bino. Yes, Gotham has been playing really well, winning three games in a row. And KC did struggle with Gotham in the beginning. But if they found a way to get the ball to Davinia, things started to go south for Gotham after that. Davinia was just doing her magic. And I have to take back what I said last week because I said Casey has a slow start in the season and they've been losing. So it's going to be an easy win. Oh, I'll take that back. <laughs> I thought Gotham was going to win this one. But with the Binia healthy, Casey. They're starting to win games. This is the end of your cell. It's so competitive. You'll never know what happened. I agree with you. Yeah, Casey's starting to find their form and they're going to be pretty scary. Mm -hmm. I feel that Amaros is a coach who's good at getting the most out of his players. Individually, our players have been putting in good roles for their skill sets. Ellie at center back has been really good. And if you look at individual performances have been pretty good. So I can't point to a player that's had a poor performance this season, which I think is a pretty fantastic sign. We're the fourth highest rated team on FOTMOB, which evaluates individual performances. Only teams above us are OL in Portland, Washington. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's only by 0.15. We're closer. Wow, wow. we're almost there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. Yeah, we just got to put together some team performances, but yeah. <laughs> on to some post-game quotes. Krieger says it's not the end of the world. They have another game on Wednesday. They go again. They learn from their mistakes and they come back together just as they've been this season and fight again. So Amaro says football doesn't have a memory. There's no time to dwell. Yep. Agree. To be successful, you cannot dwell in the past. You, you probably had a bad day. You made some mistakes. You learn from them and move on. They cannot keep thinking of a bad past that happened or the what ifs. As a player and as a human, it is hard not to think about those things, but I'm so glad that this team has that mindset. Yeah, that's one of the things you learn in soccer is have a short memory. Just push it over, keep going, <laughs> and just keep working. But also, Krieger says it's been an honor to play along with Ellie Jean at center back. So they're still learning and communication is key. They're building the relationship so they can know exactly where the other one wants the ball, the timing, and building the consistency. Yeah, and like you mentioned, or specifically, Ellie Jean just started playing that position. So it is normal for that relationship not to be there yet. But imagine just being next to Krieger and learning from her. It's it's amazing. You know, each practice and each game, they'll just keep getting better and better. Yeah, I'm on board so far. But I think the quote, or what does it call it's a bonus quote, but Victoria Pickett tweeted out that watching my two exes battle it out, Good stuff. Thumbs that up emoji. Was awesome. <laughs> yeah, she won the night. But Ruby, any stats of the game? So yeah, Gotham had eight corners this game, and that's a lot of corners, in my opinion. I would like to see more set pieces with corners and take advantage of those opportunities, make more goals. When's the last time this team had a free kick goal? Right. Wow. <laughs> it's a couple of seasons ago, right? <laughs> Yeah, gonna, I don't think yeah, it's, I don't I don't think it's as we start yeah. covering this team. I know. But Gotham was second best in two categories, shots on target and goals. Gotham had more shots, 58% possession, 110 more accurate passes. They won more ground duels, won more aerial duels. They had more successful dribbles. At the end of the day, scoreboard. I guess at the wow. end of the day, Dabinia. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Unpredictable outcome. And Gotham is still yet to be KC in five attempts. Let's get to our player of the week at Twitter. At Over Gotham Pod, fans chose Krieger. Thanks to all the fans who voted. Do you agree, Ruby? Krieger had an awesome game, a great game. But Abby was just amazing, and she had incredible saves. This game could have ended with many, many more goals if it wasn't for Abby Smith. So my player is Abby Smith. What about you? Ty. <laughs> I don't follow anybody's rules, not even <laughs> my own. Abby and Krieger, both of them. There you go. <laughs> yes. All right, let's get to our second game. The Courage, the Challenge Cup special, the quest for $1 million continues. Gotham won late against the Courage side at Red Bull Arena. Roster, Amani Dorsey's still out for an excused absence. Midge Purse is still out for her hip, and Taryn Torres out for the season. Onto the formation, another 4-3-3 slash 4-5-1. 
Goodman's daughter, Sheehan, Anamanu up front, Zerboni, Martin, and Fairley across the middle, O'Hara, Freeman, Jean, and Nicewanger across the back, and Betos returns in goal as the captain. Your thoughts, Ruby? Challenge Cup game numero dos. Second game of the Challenge Cup. <laughs> And as expected, we got lots of new faces in the starting lineup, which I really like to see because we want to see how they perform and, you know, playing the game and give them some minutes. Yeah, Gotham was the only team that played Sunday and then again on Wednesday. Both those games were on the road and the Courage played Friday. I expected rotation, maybe not this heavy, but yeah, yeah, I agree. I agree that this is the right tactic to use. Yeah, lots of travel there. But I am so happy to see Beto's back in the net. And I like how Amrose gives the keepers a chance to play by rotating them. Yeah. Let's just get to our overall thoughts, Ruby. Any of our thoughts? So this game started with an early goal and Gotham went into panic mode. It went from like Gotham is on the front foot. Gotham is pressing North Carolina, doing everything right to Gotham's in complete disarray in three minutes. (laughs) It was a pretty crazy start to this game. I know it was a, it's a roller coaster. <laughs> yeah, absolutely a roller coaster. And this was the tale of two halves. Gotham played a bunch of players who hadn't played together, and it looked like it early. <laughs> yeah, there was a lot of disconnect and a lot of open spaces where North Carolina took advantage of. Yeah, going back to Gotham being the highest pressing team in the league, the courage was just using it against Gotham. They kept playing the ball back to the keeper to pull Gotham all the way forward as possible, and then just going direct. It definitely hurt Gotham early. Onto the player notes, I feel like Nicewanger is being a bit wasted at left back. I mean, every single time she gets forward, it's a dangerous ball after dangerous ball. The ball, the Williams was sublime. Good things mm-hmm. happen when she's around the 18 as well. So we got to find ways to get her more minutes and further up the pitch. Yes, of course. Get her get her in, up in midfield. I think that would be like her sweet spot so she can help the defense and offense. Yeah, I know that preseason Alyssa Thompson was given the rookie of the year but mm-hmm. I think Nicewanger can make a case for it if she keeps playing higher up the pitch and getting more getting more minutes I think she's been fantastic so far yeah but you know like how this goes the player that starts making goals gets kind of like player of the month or rookie of the month yeah if they get her higher up the pitch she'll start making more assists more goals and yeah she can take it speaking of players scoring goals Lynn Williams is I'd say it, but she's carrying this team a bit right now. Someone else has to step up. Someone has to be a little bit selfish. The World Cup is coming. She's been a complete X factor. And I agree with what you said there. Be a little selfish. Sometimes there's a player that has the ball and they prefer to to make an extra pass than shoot the ball. I think, yeah, just be a little selfish. Go for it. You don't you don't know. You might make a goal. So just just be a little selfish. And I am a little worried for Gotham if no one else is starts stepping up other than Williams. You know, Williams is, is gonna be in the World Cup and it's not going to be a good time for Gotham if she's the only one that's that's scoring. And like you said, someone needs to step it up. We need Midge back on the field and have Ryan, Midge, and and Smith fire some shots. Absolutely. Go into some takeaways. That PK was the turning point in the match. So the mm-hmm. first Gotham PK save since 2018, first in 19 attempts. Going down 2 nothing at that point would have been devastating. So you knew with that bench we had a chance if it just stayed close. Yeah. It was significant to keep the score 1-0 going into the second half. This is when Amrose made all the changes that were necessary to turn the game around. Betos did a, a huge save for Gotham and kept them in the game. And I'm kind of glad there was a pause for the VAR there to check. I mean, the team went back to to the coach and they had some words there. And I think that like kind of like made the players stop, think and go from there. And, you know, when Betos got back to to the net, she just did that amazing save. Yeah, I'm not a fan of the way handballs are called in the box, because at that point, it's a natural position. Mm -hmm. She's jumping. Her elbows are pretty much tucked in. It's just at this point, you might as well, if you're a defender, if you're anywhere inside the box, just pin your arms behind your back. There's like no other thing you can do. If yeah. the ball goes anywhere near your arm, it's a handball. Just what else can you do? Yeah, she couldn't really do anything else. I mean, like you said, her arm was pretty tucked in. Unless she chopped her arm off or something. But 
Yeah. Right? And, and, I, and I would I would say the same thing if it was on another team as well, because I, I, as a former player, it's frustrating. But what a wild moment that was with the almost Beto's red card. Oh, my God. They didn't even call a foul on that. I kept <laughs> thinking, thank goodness we had another sub, because because I was like, who would take the gloves if we didn't have another sub? Oh, my God. That moment was... I was like, okay, if she gets a card, it's probably a yellow card. And then he comes out with a red card. And I was like, mm-hmm. why? Like, no, like, why a red card? And, and you have a good question there. Who would have taken the gloves? Who? I don't know. I don't know who. If if I would choose, I think it would. I would pick Nice Wonger. She's just so good at it. feels like at everything. And maybe if you throw her in the net, she, she'll do like something good out there. What about you? Yeah. I think Lynn Williams would Lynn Williams would have done it just because she's a superhero. So I think she would have done it. I thought about Lynn Williams too because she's <laughs> tall. But <laughs> then I was like, who's going to make the goals? Who's going to score? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. At that point, when you got Lynn Williams in goal, I, I think uh, <laughs> it's pretty much everybody in the box. Everybody playing right. defense. Well, you pick, yeah. you pick the goal scorer and I pick the assist. So <laughs> yeah. <There you> go. <laughs> anyway. Yeah, the pool reporter asked the referee about the VAR overturning the red card and foul on Beto's, and the answer came back. A drop ball was given to Gotham because there was no foul deemed on the play after review. The ball was last played by Gotham. Therefore, they were awarded a drop ball according to Law 8, the start and restart of play. Well, I'm so glad we got an explanation because it was really confusing watching it at one point. There was a red card, no red card, a drop ball. Okay, so at least we, we know what happened. Yeah, absolutely. But overall, good on Amros for managing minutes. I think two games in four days on the road is extremely tough. And he got a result. It should be a pretty fresh lineup on Sunday, hopefully with Mitch back. Yep, Sunday, they're heading to Chicago. Another away game. Yep, it's a rough week for Gotham traveling all around. Hope they, they're getting as much rest as they possibly can. I think we all we all have players that we want to see play all the time, but mm-hmm. I think this is a long, long, long season, yeah. and we we have the Challenge Cup in between the weeks now, which makes it really tough. And as we see two games in four days, I'm not saying that certain players can't do it, but this is again a long season. I'm glad they're managing minutes, and I want as much rotation as possible because as we've been through the past two seasons covering this team, there has been very little of that, and I feel like the team burned out three quarters of the way through the season in both seasons. This is good that mm-hmm. they're managing minutes. I'm glad that, that players are getting rotated. I think so far, Amros gets an A-plus on squad rotation at this mm-hmm. point. The, yeah, it's very important to give your players a rest if you want them to perform at their highest. Post-game quotes, Amros said, it was important to keep the game one nothing going into the half. The changes were made to be aggressive and go for the win. Says if there was a couple more minutes, they would have. And you know what? I agree. I think the momentum was all Gotham's at the end. Mm-hmm. Yes, they had some great moments at the end of the second half. And I understand, you know, that Christy, Ryan Williams and Smith didn't start because, like you said, they are uh, managing the minutes right and they want to give them some rest and for them to be ready for the next game. But wow, they made such a big difference in, in the game. Yeah, complete 180 from... The first half, the subs made a huge injection of energy to this team. But to me, like that shows the confidence this team has right now. I guess with Williams, all things possible. Again, she's unstoppable. Superhero. Can can we make sure she never leaves? Thanks. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, I don't know what her contract is, but extend it to infinity, (laughs) right? (laughs) Right. She retires. Yes. What is your stat of the game? Gotham was struggling to keep possession of the ball. North Carolina with 57% and then Gotham with 43. What's yeah. yours? North Carolina outpossesses everybody, so that's mm-hmm. kind of to yeah. be expected. That first game where we were outpossessing them was pretty impressive. But my stat of the week is Lynn Williams has more goals this season, 5, than any Gotham player had last season. Ooh, I don't know if I should be sad or celebrate, <laughs> but I'm just going to celebrate. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so and talking about celebrating, I didn't see a bad celebration for the last goal from Williams. Hopefully, we get to see another one in the next game. Hopefully. Bonus stat, Gotham has outshot every team they played so far this season, even in the losses. Pretty impressive. Woo. 
Yes. Let's get to our player of the week on Twitter at over Gotham pod fans chose Williams. Thanks to the fans who voted. Do you agree, Ruby? For me, Beto's and Williams did it. Did great. But Williams definitely made the difference. And like you said, you can out win games without scoring goals. Well, we didn't win this game, but we didn't lose. So that's <laughs> a win for me. Yeah, yeah, we, yeah, we're the bats now. We are. It's it's official. Uh, honestly, not just the goal. She came out of nowhere and ran down Caroline late in the mm-hmm. game after she got behind O'Hara. Lynn is 100% hustle. Defensive work rate is craziness. A complete player. Oh my God, yes. I saw, like, from the corner of my eye, I saw, like, a little dot, like, just <laughs> going by so fast. I saw that Gotham player run. And then I realized it was Williams. I was so impressed. And I was like, let's go, Lynn. <laughs> so standings, we are still the top of the group. Feels like a big point. Washes in Orlando play next Wednesday. Hope for a draw. Yes. Hopefully we, yeah, hopefully they get a draw. We need to stay there. Yeah. All right. Our next opponent, Gotham, continues their 2023 U.S. tour by heading to Chicago to face hashtag once Gotham Jenna Bike. Chicago hasn't kept a clean sheet in nine yet. They are second in goals scored. Should be a fun one. Your thoughts on this matchup, Ruby? Yes, yes, it should be interesting and fun. They've only won one game this season, and their star player, Swanson, is out. Unfortunately for Chicago, fortunately for us. Hopefully she gets better soon. Chicago has always been a strong team, and I'm just hoping for for Gotham to win here. Yeah, I think there's going to be goals. And as you said, Chicago without Swanson is a not as strong a side. So let's just put it that way. Lynn should continue her scoring streak in mm-hmm. this one. So Ruby, what are we manifesting this week? We are manifesting goals in the first half and goals in the second half. <laughs> what about you? <laughs> yeah, let's get back to clean sheets again. Gotham leads the league in clean sheets. Let's add to it. Any random thoughts before we go? Yes. So like I said at the beginning, I have part two of my dentist story. So six months ago, I went to get my regular cleaning. So I went in and I was waiting in, in, you know, in the waiting room and they, I thought they called my name, but in reality, they called Shelby, not Ruby. And I was talking to the, the person there and she's like, you know, like she knew me and I was like, oh, perfect. Like, it feels like I don't ever want to leave here anyway. So then they they figured out that I was not Shelby. I was Ruby. I was just so glad that Shelby also had a cleaning like <laughs> that day as well. What if it was an extraction? I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> but today I went back to the dentist and, you know, like I was thinking about last time, you know, I was like, you know what, this time I'm going to sit really close of to the door where they come out and they say your name <laughs> and I'm going to pay attention because last time I was on my phone. So I was like waiting there. And as I was waiting, the nurse comes out and she's like, Shelby. And I was like, Oh my God, Shelby's here. So I finally got to meet Shelby, but I didn't say anything. I just thought I was like so weird that she was there again on the same day at the same time. I don't know if they do this on on purpose, the scheduling, but we were there at the same time. So I just thought that was like funny that Shelby was there. But this time, yeah, I heard. I made sure it was my name. (laughs) So you should have worn a name tag or a big shirt that said like Ruby (laughs) on it. (laughs) A shirt that says I'm Ruby. (laughs) Not Shelby. (laughs) Any random thoughts from you? No random thoughts from me this week. I'm just super excited for the future of the sport. And... The USLW League, which will turn into the USL Super League, is a great way for the grow of this league. And, and you'll see the many reasons why it's so important to the future of women's soccer. So I yeah. just so excited to preview them, preview the USLW League again. Again, let's just get to it. Let's talk to our friend Jennifer Tuesta of Paisley FC, shall we? Let's go. Let's go. All right, Gotham SC fans, I am asking you to take a ride with me, a ride to Soccer Town, USA, Kearney, New Jersey, to preview the future, well, the past and the future of women's soccer. I'm hoping you all know about the USLW League by now. 
Hopefully you're already supporting a team, but if you haven't, here's a good chance to find one. You know our guests from their unrivaled social media game. With me today is the general manager of the newest team in the Metropolitan Division, Paisley FC. Welcome to the show, Jennifer Tuesta. Thanks, Gary. Thanks for having me. I'm really excited to uh, to be on tonight. Absolutely. Like as we were just talking about, there there's a million reasons to be excited about the W League and the next, of course, the Super League, which is coming, which we'll get into. But like one thing is certain. Everybody I've talked to in this space about the W League has an undying love for the sport and just a passion of growing the sport. And that's one thing you, Jennifer, and Paisley just radiate. And I can't wait to explore the history of this team and Carney and the future of this team. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think, you know, the W League is doing some amazing things, as we can see. The front office has been wonderful to work with. I mean, everyone is just so passionate. They know the game, and it, it's just a really great time to be involved in in the league and, you know, everything that they're going to be doing with the Super League, too. I, I think it's all great stuff and just great for women's soccer. Women's, well, especially women's soccer. I think the level of opportunity has never matched the amount of talent, and I think that shows. And I think that's just why, a big reason why the W League is very, very important. Yeah, definitely. I mean, you hit the nail on the head there. I, I think, you know, I, it's 40,000, 50,000 women play college soccer across all levels in the U.S. And there's what in the NWSL, you know, you have 12 teams right now. There's, you know, 20 to 24 players on a roster. I mean, that's like 250, 250 spots for all those people that, you know, want opportunities to continue to play in the United States. And I, I think we just need to do better and continue to expand that because, there needs to be an opportunity. If there's not an opportunity, I mean, what are women supposed to do? It, it's disappointing, but I think the W League, the Super League, they're providing these opportunities. So it's, it's a really good time to, to be in women's soccer. And I'm, I'm really excited about, you know, where the sport is going because, you know, when I played that these opportunities didn't exist and it's nice to see that they do now. Some players just need a little more development. It's, right, like, like the way the structure is now, if like you're not ready to go right now, the play right now, it's pretty much it for you. And as we just touched on, like, just imagine you're a keeper. Like, how many spots on a 10-team 10, 10 league is there for keepers? 30? And that's 30 out of the best in the world. How many keepers are there at college soccer? How many players get drafted? If you make a roster, how hard is it to get on the field? So just this is so super important. I just love all of this. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think Goalkeeping is a very unique position in that, you know, you're not going to sub the goalkeeper in a game. So if you're not on a roster, you need playing time. So I think USL, I mean, a variety of different leagues, like it needs to expand past just, okay, we have this for women where it's, you know, three months during the summer where you see on the men's side, there's met much more opportunity even outside of the MLS where men can play year round and, and that's necessary in the women's game and it will create more opportunities. And like I said, I think we're heading in that direction, but it's it's long overdue. It's not just uh, opportunities. It's also professional environments. And we're, we'll, get, we'll definitely get into Paisley's more, but just as a former player yourself, how much would it have meant to your career to have this type of outlet? I, I It would have been invaluable, I think. You know, when I grew up playing after college, it was, I think the NWSL had been around for about a year. So my choice was to either try to make it in that on very limited funds or go overseas. And, you know, at, at that time, I, I didn't want to go overseas and financially just couldn't really make the NWSL work. So had mm -hmm. to go into corporate America. I, I don't have any regrets about that, but that was was where things were at the time that I graduated college. So kind of had to stop playing, unfortunately. I know so many players like you, and this is why I'm so passionate about this particular project, just because I know so many players that just fell off that were so super talented and just could have done amazing things. We're talking like national team level talent that could have, but they just, there's obviously no money, no opportunities. Then you got to go overseas to a place that you, like, I have so much respect for those women that took the chance and like went to another country a language I didn't know and just had to like, that's what you had to do, right? Yeah. I mean, I have so much respect and I know some women that I played with who are still currently overseas chasing their dreams and more power mm -hmm. to them because that's truly amazing. They're inspirational to me. Mm -hmm. But in my career, that just, it, it just wasn't something that I could foresee myself 
enjoying or, you know, being mentally prepared for. I, I think it's it's a very tough journey. I mean, you see the life of a professional athlete, especially on the women's side. I, I think people think it's all rainbows and butterflies. This is great, but it is, it's a slog. It's very, very hard. If you're not on a great team, you know, with a national team being paid very well, it's, it's a grind. And I have so much respect for people in any league that, that are going through that because it's, it's challenging mentally, physically, emotionally. I mean, I I think again, that's kind of the direction we're heading where, you know, the professional environments are so important to make sure that there's equality within women's soccer, where there's access to the best trainers, there's access to training facilities, there's access to fair compensation, because you can't live on certain salaries. And I just think there's, again, a lot of work to be done, but a lot of progress has been made. So I'm hopeful that things will continue to get better. Yeah. And you you touched on a little bit of that. And also, it builds fan bases in winners pro soccer deserts, because there's, again, 12 teams, two of them are in California. What's going on across the rest of the country that these players don't have academy structures? They don't have uh, players that they can grow up like admiring from afar and getting that passion for the game. So this brings so many new fans into the sport. It makes it accessible. Yeah, I think accessibility within soccer is huge, especially on the women's side. I, I think we've seen, even with USLW, you'll see a lot of the new franchises have a ton of fans. I mean, Minnesota is a great example. Obviously a rival now, but you know, had admired them from afar the, the past year or two. I mean, I think they're just doing wonderful things. Their fan base community engagement is is something to, you know, aspire to. And it's it's just nice to see that that's possible in anywhere in the US, really. It's possible. If you have a team, people will come support it, especially on the women's side, because women's sports right now, women's soccer, I mean, it's it is the moment. It is happening, whether people like it or not, and people will support it, which is amazing to see. Mm-hmm. And going back to what we talked about was just the talent level. I think sometimes people get the feeling or get the idea that just because you're not on an NWSL roster or you know an FA roster, that these players aren't that talented because they are. They absolutely are that talented. And just the watching the USLW League last season, these players are ready to play pro. These players are ready. And there's so many players like that just need need a, need a chance. And and Paisley and the rest of the USLW is going to give a chance to those players. Yeah, definitely. I think the that's part of the accessibility piece too, where you know just having these opportunities and having roster spots for people to women specifically to to compete on is it's crucial. I mean, I I go back to you know the the college argument where there's you know huge women's soccer college ecosystem, variety of divisions. But you have to look at junior colleges, too. I mean, so many good players have come out of junior colleges. And I think there's a common misconception in soccer as a whole in America where, oh, uh, that, you know, the best players are always Division One. I. I mean, that could not be more far from the truth. I think there's so many talented players across all divisions. And you'll even see that with Paisley. I mean, we have a variety of divisions represented. We have people who are former professionals. I mean, I think it's just there's there's so much talent out there that it's, it's almost, it's, it's embarrassing how much talent is out there. It is crazy. It, it's just so nice to have the opportunities now and just make sure that these women are able to represent themselves on a high level because, you know, the NWSL is great. I think it's a wonderful league, but it's not all that there is. You know, USL is doing things with the Super League, providing more opportunities. There's so much talent out there. There's not enough spots right now for the talent that is currently out there in the US and just, I mean, even internationally. Yeah, I agree with you 1000%. All right, let's shift gears a little bit. You guys play in one of the most special places in the country when it comes to soccer, Soccer Town USA. So tell us a little bit about Carney. Born and raised in Kearney, New Jersey, I think soccer has always been a huge part of the culture, really originated with the Scottish immigrants that had come over and started playing, um, you know, in Kearney, right East North Harrison area, Hudson County, basically. And they brought the game with them. So that established a, a big soccer community in Kearney. Kearney Thistle, which is our, our youth affiliate club, has been around for a very long time. You know, a lot of great men's players and women's players have come out of Kearney. I mean, you think of Tony Miola, John Harks went to Kearney High School. So it's a hotbed for talent. And, you know, the the Scottish heritage, 
really propelled that, but the demographics have definitely shifted now. But I think the love for the game has has remained, and if not, you know, gotten even stronger. I think right now, really uh, diverse population who all love the game. I think there's a, a big South American contingent. You know, Portuguese, Spanish, Polish. I mean, there's it's just really a melting pot of all these cultures that really love and appreciate the game. So it. Cardi's always been known for Soccer Town USA, you know, very blue collar, very, you know, scrappy. I, I think it's um it's a great place to have grown up, to have, have started out playing soccer there. I mean, I think again, it was my first, you know, tryout for Thistle was on Harvey Field. That's our home field. I playing at Kearney High School, there was always just this pride behind being from Kearney, knowing that, you know, soccer is such a rich tradition in the town and, and always wanting to represent that to the best of, of our ability. And I have a little bit of that in my in my blood as well. Growing up, like my brother played soccer and I played soccer. But we were like the only ones in my immediate family who played soccer. My grandmother used to always tell me about this Uncle Sonny I had that played soccer in Kearney and for a family that really knew not much about soccer they knew Kearney was like the place and if you played there you were good <laughs> yeah I, th I think you know if you're from Kearney and you played soccer usually nine times out of ten you're pretty legit so I yeah. think <laughs> you know having that chip on our shoulder is always you know it, it's just a nice thing I think the sense of community the support that the town gives to you know players who either go play abroad, you know, the national team, there's still such a, a support system here. And, you know, a lot of that is translated over to Paisley, which has been really nice. Yeah. So how did Paisley get started? So Paisley was founded in 2021 with the mission to create opportunities and, and advance women's soccer in the area, because having such a rich soccer history, Carney, I mean, there's no women's team. A lot of players would come through, play high school, end up going out to, back out playing in college. And, you know, you'd come back and you'd have to go somewhere else to, to play in the summer, continue to play. We already have this wonderful youth club with Carney Thistle. And, you know, an opportunity came up to join United Women's Soccer League, too. And, you know, I think that was just seen as this is a way we can create opportunities for these women who deserve them because there's, a, again, so many girls, young girls in Kearney that play soccer who need the opportunity to continue to play. And I think Paisley was able to create that and eventually moved up to United Women's Soccer League One last year and then had the opportunity to go into USLW, which has been super exciting. I mean, I think the W League is very well known. We know that they're coming out with the Super League, which is professional league. So there's a lot of hype around it. But the most important thing is for our youth players to to see the game. They need to see the game and they need to be able to look up to athletes on our first team, on our U23 team and, and say like, hey, I have a pathway. This is what I can be if I want to. Yeah, absolutely. And where, where is the stadium? Where, where, you, where do you play? So our home field for this year for USLW is, is Harvey Field. Mm-hmm. In Kearney. We played at Kearney High School last year, but Harvey is really some of the, it, it's where some of the best soccer matchups in Kearney have ever occurred. I mean, I think it's our Kearney High School field. So really just, again, a lot of rich history and tradition there. Yeah. And just for the fans who aren't familiar with the USLW League, you're now part of the Metropolitan Division, which is pretty exciting. That is a very, very competitive grouping there. So we have uh, Morris Elite, who plays at a Rutgers, and Morris Elite plays in the Newark campus. We have the Cedar Stars, which play out of the Capelli Sports Complex in Tinton Falls. There's the Long Island Rough Riders. That's another historic club, and they play out of Unendale, New York. You got Manhattan SC, who play out of Staten Island at the College of Staten Island. You have AC Connecticut, uh, and they play at Western Connecticut State University in Danbury, Connecticut. Then we have your Paisley uh, FC. You're also going to be joined by the Westchester Flames, who play in New Rochelle, New York, and the FA Euro, who play out of Brooklyn, New York. So these are historic soccer towns in this area. How excited are you to play against some of these, again, historic soccer towns? I'm super excited. I mean, honestly, I, I wish I was still playing and didn't hang out my cleats last year. So many amazing clubs and, and looking forward to excellent matchups. I mean, I think being in the northern New Jersey, New York metropolitan area, it's such a hotbed for talent. I mean, I still to this day will argue with anyone that this is, 
you know, the premier location for, you know, soccer development. There are so many good players around here that I think it's nice to be able to compete at such a high level with, you know, so many other clubs who are chock full of, of excellent players. So who runs the award-winning socials over there at Paisley? <laughs> so it, it's a bit of a team effort. I mean, I I do a lot on the the Twitter and the Instagram, mm-hmm. but we have a team. I mean, I, I think it's, you know, a lean team, but we, we do the best that we can, you know, on, on social media. It's just been really fun interacting with fans and engaging with fans and, you know, making new friends, honestly. We've, we've made quite a few connections on, on social, which is, has been nice. And you guys are looking for volunteer activities. So if you're looking to get a start in women's soccer, you can volunteer with Paisley. I, I saw a post, If tell me if this is still all valid, that you're still looking for a social media coordinator, graphic designer, videographer, merchandise coordinators, equipment managers, game day operation coordinators, team videographers, game day stats and analysts, and game day streaming coordinators. Are you still looking for those? Yes, we are. I think, you know, as much help as possible is always appreciated. I mean, it it takes a village. Like I said, we have a very small team right now. So to be able to take some things off my plate and then the rest of the team's plate would be nice. So I think it's a really good opportunity, especially if you're, you know, a sport management major, which, you know, near and dear to my heart. I graduated Seton Hall with a sport management major and, you know, found my way back into into sports through Paisley. So I think it's it's just a good opportunity and a really exciting time to be involved in women's soccer. So I would highly encourage anyone who's interested, please reach out and, and apply via our Google form. Um, you know, happy to have a conversation. And where would they find that Google form? The Google form is on all of our socials. If you go to our link tree, there's a, a volunteer application. So that will, um, you know, just lead you to upload your resume and, you know, we will get back to you as soon as we receive that application. Yeah. And it's not just the passionate team. It's a passionate fan base as well. So tell us about your fan experience so far with uh, Paisley. Um, I think the fans so far have been wonderful. We've really tied into the community. I mean, I think the the youth clubs around here have been showing up. It's not only Carney Thistle. I mean, we've had Ironbound, Pasco, um, a variety of different youth girls teams come to our games, which has, has really been amazing. I think, you know, being able to inspire the next generation, have them come and, and watch, um, you know, some wonderful women play soccer has been awesome. And I think the the town of Kearney, like I said, the rich soccer history has definitely been a big proponent in getting people out to games. And I, I think also just tying into Gotham and, and their fan base. I mean, I think we're right in their backyard. So if you like soccer, if you like to go to Gotham games, I mean, come to a Paisley game because you're going to, to see some great high level soccer. And tell us a little about your team itself, some some players that we should know about. Yeah, I mean, I think we have a really exciting roster this year. It's been fun putting that together. Returning players, we have Nicolette Dries, who's a former NWSL player with the Orlando Pride, uh, plays for the Puerto Rican women's national team. She's our number 10. Really excellent player, really exciting to watch. I think, you know, definitely leading the midfield. And we have Mackenzie Meixner on defense, one of our center backs, who was actually U.S. Uh, excuse me, UWS Iron Woman from last year, played every minute, tough as nails. We have Madi Torres, who plays for the El Salvador women's national team. She is um, a forward. We're really excited to, to get her back on the pitch this year. I mean, I think last year was cut short, unfortunately, due to an injury, but, you know, really excited to see what Madi can do this year. Um, we have some newcomers in, in Jess Johnson and Farrell Pomponio, who we're really excited about. I mean, I, I could talk about the entire roster. I mean, Odaliana Gomez is coming in as a goalkeeper, uh, played for Queensboro last year. She goes to the University of Delaware as a Dominican Republic women's national team player. I mean, there's there's just so much talent on the roster, so much depth. I know I'm missing a lot of people, but I think it's really exciting group um, that we're, we're thrilled to, to get out on the pitch. And what type of player are you looking for? Like, what is a characteristic or is there a certain something that you're looking for in a player that for the play for Paisley? You know, as a former player on Paisley myself, I think the most important things are coachability. I think being a good teammate is super important. Having the a no quit attitude, hustling, being committed. I mean, I think there's a lot of things that are very much within 
a player's control that are, are attributes that we really look for. Um, I think you could be the most talented person on the planet, but if you don't have a good attitude, if you're not coachable, if you're not going to show up, I mean, that's not, that's not the player for us. We're looking for people who are humble, hardworking, dedicated, and determined. And, you know, I, I think we've done a good job in, in putting a roster together that reflects that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that's the number. It's the number one thing when it comes to like. Obviously, you always get used players that always ask you like, like, how do you become a pro and all that stuff. The first thing I always tell them is be coachable. It is the number one thing. Is is if you're coachable, you can be the most talented player in the world, but if you're not coachable, you're not really going to be good to anybody uh, at the, the higher levels. And I've played with players that were again super talented, but they weren't coachable. And I've played you know pro with some players. I'm like, how did you become a pro? But there are but they're coachable, right? So that's kind of always like, again, as you said, in your control, be coachable, have the right attitude, show up every day, work hard. Those are the main things that people look for in a player. Yeah, I mean, I think talent only takes you so far. So I, I think it, especially when it comes to being a professional, obviously I, I didn't play at the professional level, but the people that I know who did play, who do play and did play at the professional level, they weren't always the most talented person, but they were the people who had the professionalism they were on time they you know knew how to take care of their bodies they they trained extra when they needed to so i think you know it's a total package when it comes to you know being a professional athlete and as far as your ambitions are concerned so we're talking about the usl super league like how how does one qualify for the super league or is it just having the resources I don't know the exact answer to that question, but I think a lot of it is tied to resources, facilities, making sure that the standards are met, which is super important to us because, you know, having to hit certain professional standards, I mean, that should be across the board for a league. So I I think Mm -hmm. it really will depend on a variety of different factors. But if the Super League is open to having us, we're, you know, more than open to, uh, you know, being a part of that. Fantastic. How do you feel? Obviously, this is the World Cup year. So how do you feel about that infecting the increase in investment in your team and the league? I think with World Cup years, you'll always see a bump in Mm -hmm. attendance to games. So that's super exciting. I I think, you know, there's a definite buzz around women's soccer as there should be. Like I said, I, I think this is the moment for women's soccer and it's not going anywhere. And I think people are finally realizing that the investment is necessary. I was at a a conference last week for women in sports business, and there's just such a disparity in investment in women's sports as opposed to men's sports. And women's sports are watched. Women's sports are not a charity. They are something that need to be treated equitably and in the same line as, as men's sports. So I think people are actually finally realizing this, and I'm hopeful that the investment will continue to come. I mean, you'll see things in the NWSL. You'll see Ally putting in all of their resources and sponsorship into the NWSL. I mean, I think the slogan is watch the game, change the game. And and that's very true. So I think with the World Cup coming up, I, I'm optimistic and hopeful that much more investment will come, much more necessary investment will come into the women's game. And where can they find you? They can find me on Twitter at jpettwesta. Um, <laughs> they can find me. Yeah, I think you can just find me on Twitter right now. And and where can they find Paisley? They can find us at Harvey Field this summer playing in Kearney, New Jersey. Our USLW games, we have our schedule published. I mean, please come out and, and watch our games. I mean, I think you won't be disappointed with, with the level of play and just the experience. I think it's it's going to be a, a great summer of soccer in Soccer Town, USA. Absolutely. All right, Jennifer, as I told you earlier, I got through about half of my questions for you. So <laughs> I would love to have you back on. We'll check in with you when the, you know we get a little further on in the league. Sadly, we come to the end of this interview. Again, I want to thank you for taking your time to talk to me. I love the passion that everyone has at the USLW and growing the sport. And it's, it's my favorite thing. So thank you for taking the time with me. Yeah, no, thank you, Gary. I really appreciate you having me on the show and uh, looking forward to continuing to having this conversation. Yes. Are you a Gotham fan yourself? I am. Awesome. Because Gotham returns to action this Sunday, May 7th, away at Chicago. I am ready for this matchup. You ready? Yeah, definitely ready. I mean, I think it's a very 
exciting game coming off an unfortunate loss last night. Uh, but looking forward to, to seeing them come out. And I think they're really finding their team identity. I think throughout the season this far with, with the new coach, it's just been evident that everyone's getting more comfortable with each other. There's chemistry. So I'm, I'm really excited about Gotham this year. I think it's a really great time to be a Gotham fan. Agree. All right, let's go. Hi, everyone. This is Gary. Thank you for listening and supporting our project. Here are other ways you can support the show and connect with us. First, word of mouth is everything. So please share our show with anyone who might listen. Also, please rate us five stars on Spotify and review us on iTunes. You can purchase our merchandise at the Tee Public Store. Join in the conversation on Twitter at OverGothamPod and Instagram at SoccerOverGotham. Lastly, you can email your thoughts and questions at SoccerOverGotham at gmail.com. Once again, thank you.